Coming next to the stage is Sarah Blaine and Evan Clark. Sarah is a mom, an activist, a humanist lobbyist from Arizona with more than 20 years of political and nonprofit experience. She's also served on the board of directors for the Secular Coalition for Arizona, the Prescott Pride Center, and the Arizona Interfaith Movement. She was the recipient of Foundation Beliefs Humanist Innovator of the Year Award for 2014. Let's welcome Sarah Bland. And joining her on stage, returning to Free Thought Day from a visit many years ago, is Evan Clark. Evan is an activist, facilitator, and entrepreneur with over 10 years of experience consulting nonprofits. He's the chair of the Secular Student Alliance and co-host for the Humanist Experience podcast. Evan, come on up. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah and Evan. All right. You all have been sitting for a little bit, so this will be a little strange for a second, but if anyone wants a stretch break, let's do a quick, like, stand up. We could do a little, like, stretch yeah, off to one side, stretch the other. It's very cult-like, I know, but, but go with it for a second. Yeah. Great. Yeah, we're, we're big, happy humanists. Wonderful. Thank you all. I just wanted to give you all a second to do that. Good afternoon. So I am Sarah Blaine. This is Evan Clark, my business partner, and we run a humanist communications firm called Spectrum Experience. And we like to call ourselves entrepreneurial humanists. What that means for us is that where we see issues of moral urgency, we try to build innovative humanist projects to address those issues and apply our values. So over the past 10 years, we've founded or helped start over a dozen atheist, humanist, and free thought community groups around the country. We've built secular political advo advocacy groups, hosted humanist podcasts, and even launched and worked on two humanist congressional campaigns. We're currently working on launching a humanist policy center, building a humanist media network, and establishing a humanist business incubator. We like to build things. <laughs> And um, while we identify strongly as humanists ourselves, we want to talk today about the whole free thought movement's need to commit to relevance, all of us. Humanists, scientists, Satanists, this whole variety of thinkers that we have in our movement. The fundamental principle behind all varieties of free thought identity is that for us, ethics are naturalistic and human-centered. Not that humans are the most important object of our moral concern, but that our need for ethics to begin with comes from the fact that we exist as humans with the wants, needs, values, and responsibilities associated with that. So, <laughs> whoa. So if our movement is not concerned with the needs and values of people in the current time and place, we're pointless. We have to be ready to take on new moral issues as they emerge, as we learn more, as our technology changes, and we can't cling to mores. Now, really religious conservative, uh, conservative religious traditions struggle with this because the Bible, for example, doesn't uh, have much to say about stem cell research or artificial intelligence. So their, found, their foundational moral laws don't change with new technology but our moral knowledge does. In the second wave of American feminism, for example, freethinkers participated in asking questions like, does gender matter? Should difference of gender equate to different sets of rights and responsibilities? We didn't have to resist those questions out of reverence for tradition or social mores. We could look at what we'd learned about neurology, psychology and human development, rights and capabilities, and we updated our social ethics to align with an improved understanding of reality and what human needs, wants, values, and responsibilities looked like in 1970s American society. Freethinkers stayed relevant and participated in second wave feminism. So the question now is, what are the values and responsibilities of our greater communities in this time? And what new tools do we have to update our moral knowledge? I want to tell a quick story about 30 years ago. In 1988, 
a NASA scientist named James Hansen, testified before the Senate Energy Committee and alerted the country to the arrival of global warming. In his testimony, he described three key points. Number one, the Earth has gotten significantly warmer, and 1988 was going to be the warmest year in recorded history. Number two, global warming is almost certainly being caused by a greenhouse effect, which is uh, enhanced by emissions of gases like carbon dioxide and methane from burning fossil fuels. And number three, as a result, summer heat waves and other extreme weather events will become more common. Again, this was 1988. Climate scientists in the United States had been sounding the alarm for years at this point already about the long-term dangers of global warming. The activists among them were demanding new policies, regulating fossil fuels, and long-term plans for how to stop the worst case scenarios, often described as the year 2030. Uh, um, they wanted to stop those from happening. The oil and coal companies, worried about their profits if new regulations were passed, hired their own climate scientists to research global warming. Funny enough, they actually came to the same conclusions. Global warming's real, and global temperatures were going up, and it's most likely caused by the burning of fossil fuels. And while they spent the next few decades on millions upon millions of dollars on propaganda campaigns to discredit the new science on the topic, the evidence was clear. And if we didn't, um, <coughs> and if we didn't address this issue, the big plans and bold policies that, were, uh, that we would essentially guarantee a dangerous and uncertain future for every child of future generations. Again, the evidence was clear. Well, in August of 1988, just two months after that Senate testimony, I was born. And every year since I've turned 26, the Earth's temperature has set a new global record. And there's no sign that our future looks better. The reason this story is important is because the issues of climate change exemplify a perfect, perfect example of something that only became relevant to the public once science illuminated it for us. Climate scientists gave us the data and narrative needed to understand a massive, complicated, global issue. And using this new info, this new moral knowledge, suddenly people could make climate change the radically relevant issue that it should be. But sadly, society didn't follow the science, and we all know how the story is today. But for us, Free thinkers, we need to recognize how climate change is not just still a moral issue, it's becoming an ever increasing moral issue of our time. And we need to recognize how intersectionality makes almost all other health and social issues connected to it more dangerous. Now, climate change isn't controversial in our movement. We have done a great job of showing up for science and the planet. But there are many other issues before us that don't receive enough of our time and attention, despite their relevance and moral urgency. And as we think about where those issues are in the free thought movement, committing to relevance means we cannot stay quiet merely for the sake of cohesion. We can't be discouraged by conflict in our movement because upheaval is entailed in progress and innovation. So we have to view conflict as a tool for progress. When we back away from taking a stand on the most relevant moral issues of our time because we're afraid of controversy or we don't think the free thought movement has a position, we're really failing at free thought. Where do we think these positions come from? We're not waiting for revelation as free thinkers. We're creating naturalistic, human-centered ethics. So where the free thought movement does not have a position on relevant moral issues, it's time to come up with one. It's time to collaboratively wrestle through the process of figuring out how our movement is going to stay relevant. So we need to have a position on Black Lives Matter, even if it challenges us to confront our privilege and makes us uncomfortable and defensive, and we don't want to criticize one another or alienate ourselves. We need to have a position on guns, even if it challenges us to confront what makes us feel safe and free and what actually makes us safe and free. If we don't have a position on guns, if we don't have a position on Black Lives Matter because those are too controversial or all free thinkers don't agree, we're failing to use conflict as a tool for progress. 
and we're not applying our values in places that they're needed. The secular community didn't wake up one morning and suddenly decide, for example, to support abortion rights. Freethinkers had to ask questions about that. We had to argue with one another. We had to confront our privilege and be uncomfortable. And there's no question about whether the secular community has something to say about women's right to reproductive health care today. The American Humanist Association's first official position on abortion came in 1977, which was four years after Roe v. Wade, a little late to the party, right? But still, it was another 17 years before there was enough political will in this country to pass the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act. That's a lot of years of controversy and barricades, and AHA was on the higher ground as an outlier, doing advocacy work and making change in our culture. And while we wrestle with the issues of today's news cycle, we also have a moral responsibility to be thinking about the issues of tomorrow. There's this metaphor story I once heard that I think articulates why. It's about these three doctors walking along a river together. As they walk, all the doctors suddenly spot a puppy floating down the river. So immediately, the first doctor jumps in to save the puppy's life. But then more puppies keep floating down the river. The first doctor is doing everything they can to stop the puppies from getting uh, by them in the river. So that, and then the second doctor starts running upstream. First doctor yells out, where are you going? I need your help saving these puppies. And the second doctor replies, I'm going upstream because if I catch the puppies earlier, I'll be able to save more puppies. But more and more puppies keep floating down the river. The first and second doctor are doing everything they can to save the puppies' lives, but their arms are starting to get full, so they ask for help from the third doctor. The third doctor, like the other two doctors, is horrified by the situation, but takes a few seconds to analyze the situation, and then she starts running upstream as well, but runs right past the second doctor. So the second doctor screams, where are you going? I need your help saving these puppies. And the third doctor yells back, I'm gonna run up to the bridge to see who's throwing puppies in the river. <laughs> and it's kind of a silly story that probably could use some extra intersectional edits eventually, but what I like about the metaphor is that it's always a good reminder that we be thinking about the upstream causes of the problems we're trying to address. The social issues of tomorrow will be rooted, <clears throat> rooted in the systems and institutions and culture that we're modeling today. If we're gonna talk about the issues that I see we're gonna have to quickly face as a culture, like the ethical implications of technologies like artificial intelligence, an automated economy, driverless cars, or how we're gonna update and restructure outdated systems like our criminal justice system, our citizenship system, or our education system, we have to be thinking about the upstream causes. As free thinkers, we have no illusions about appeals to tradition. We know just because ideas are tenacious, tenacious, that doesn't mean they're valuable. So I would argue we should always be pushing up against the cutting edge of progressive ideas. We should be prepared and excited to bring our moral tools of inquiry and compassion to push for the most modern and updated answers. As free thinkers, we have to work hard through conflict and controversy to overcome status quo bias and keep our ethics relevant. And to be relevant, our ethical framework has to be applied. We get concerned about armchair free thought because it undermines itself. Free thought interacts with and challenges the status quo to find the truth of the human situation. And you can't discover the truth about our ethical responsibilities as humans if you stay only in an ivory tower while most of us experience life down in the mud. Free thought, skepticism, humanism, these are all ways of actively engaging with people in the world, not just thinking about the world. To suppose that we have anything to say about goodness and truth if we choose not to respond actively when the most vulnerable among us are denied the most basic human rights, if we suppose that the minimum conceptions of morality are met when we theorize about racial inequality and economic stratification, but set aside the immediate needs of people experiencing homelessness, sexual violence, police brutality. That's wrong. We have to apply our values even as we're theorizing about them. The world is crying out for applied free thought, secularism, and humanism. And our free thought communities are perfect places to implement it. 
And the history of our movement, it's a brave one. Free thought leaders were the faces of the democracy movement, of slave abolition movements, of the women's right movement, of the LGBT movement, of the civil rights movement. It's involved in the dreamer movement and the climate change movement. So the question now is, are you and your communities going to be the brave and relevant leaders of our time? Thank you. <laughs>